Now, believe it or not, this really is work. For the last two weeks, I have been driving this gorgeous Aston Martin V8 Vantage S, courtesy of its very kind owner and good friend, Richard Groves, from the YouTube channel Challenge the Road. Some of you may recognise the car because this isn't its first time on the channel. I actually featured it last year, shortly after Richard acquired it, when it was entirely standard. But, as you can probably tell, that is no longer the case. Like myself, Richard has not just a fondness for driving, but also a real soft spot for the baby Aston. In terms of providing both luxury, badge appeal and driver involvement, it is excellent value for money, with up until recently examples of the early 4.3 cars being available for as little as £20,000. But fabulous though it may be, the Vantage, early ones in particular, are far from perfect, and Richard saw an opportunity. He wanted to create a line of cars designed to appeal to the driver who wanted something enjoyable, affordable, and also tailored to their requirements. He thought that the early 4.3 Vantage would be the perfect base, and when he began the project, he was absolutely right. I drove his first example and found it to be all round a much better car than the standard item. Unfortunately, not long after he built that car, the prices of early models in particular began to rise, and he felt they no longer offered the value for money that he wanted to have. So, he has decided to change his approach a little, and start with a car that already cost a little bit more. In this case, the fabulous V8 Vantage S, which to my eyes is one of the best looking, best sounding and just most exciting Astons out there. But, like the 4.3, it too is a flawed beast. For me, it's a little bit too firm, a little bit too focused in some areas, and in some ways compromised as a road car, which for me is what an Aston Martin should always be. So, shortly after I had driven the car in standard form, Richard began work. The process thus far has taken about eight months, in which time he's done many different things to the car, some of which still remain, some of which have now gone. The enhancements include cosmetic, performance, and some other subtle tweaks too. Come Christmas time, I knew Richard was wrapping up with the first round of modifications and would soon be wanting my feedback, so I had a brainwave. I phoned him and I said, Richard, I know you came for me to drive your Aston once again, and I've got an idea. I'm headed up to Scotland soon for a couple of weeks, and because I'm such a good friend, if you really ask me nicely, I'll happily take your Aston Martin up there and, you know, though it may be tough, though it may be difficult, I'll drive your lovely car over some absolutely fantastic roads and give you all the feedback that I can. Him, being the all-round legend that he is, said yes, not a problem James, here's the keys, go have fun. And here I am, and fun I am having. But it's not quite as simple as that. Because you see, I am not actually a very big fan of some of the changes made to this, and for me, I think it has missed the brief. But this is absolutely fine, and I know he doesn't mind me saying this because the whole point of me having this car is to help develop it, is to help give feedback on what I think the car should be. And the simple fact is, the whole point of the CTR Vantage is to create something that you want, and your ideas of what is right or wrong may be very different to my own. So today, rather than giving you a review of this car, because that would be unfair, it still isn't a finished article, I'm going to be talking you through the changes that have been made, why some of them work, why some of them don't work, and the process involved in trying to create a car like this, and how it isn't really that easy to try and beat what Aston Martin have done. So then, what is different about this car versus the last time you saw it? Well, in no particular order, but trying to be somewhat logical. At the front you have this big old GT4 carbon fibre splitter, these carbon fibre canards, a carbon fibre bonnet, which looks like the one on the V12 Vantage, but is not the same, it's a custom item. You have chopped carbon fibre badges, front and rear. You have DBS alloys on this. These are not necessarily part of the package, they're one of the many items you can customise. Behind those you have bespoke discs and pads for this car. You've also got Michelin Pilot Sport 4S tyres. I can't remember what it was wearing before, but these are fresh ones. At the back you have a carbon fibre valance, a new exhaust, 
Inside, you have a similar treatment. Out have gone the heavy electrically operated Aston Martin seats. In have come a pair of lightweight Cobra Nagaros, which I am really a big fan of. They have some custom stitching with a CTR decal here and there. You've got new floor mats, you've got new pedals, which is a much bigger deal than you may think, I assure you. And a few other nice touches too, like a lightweight battery. All of these things have combined to create a car which is considerably lighter than standard. Before the mods were begun, the car weighed 1,685 kilos. The last time it was weighed, it was 1,592. For my American chums, it's a weight saving of some 200 pounds. Power is also up. By default in the Vantage S, it makes around 430. But this car was dynoed at about 460, and that is before any bespoke mapping work has been done. So it's quicker, it's lighter, and to complete the package, it also has a fully adjustable coilover suspension on it. In other words, all of the ingredients to make it brilliant. Why then do I feel that it falls a little bit short? Let's begin on the outside. I wasn't aware of all the visual changes that Richard had made until about a couple of days before I got this car. And I have to say, there were two things that stood out to me. First off, the DBS alloys. I think it makes the car look a little bit undertired. There's just not much sidewall here. They're also quite heavy, and that has an impact we'll feel out on the road. But more than that, these rears do stick out quite a bit on account of being designed for a different car. However, in person, I'm not actually that opposed to them. And I'm sure there are plenty of people out there for whom that's the perfect wheel. But I preferred the standard 19 inch items or some nice lightweight jobbies in a bronze color, please, to go with this gorgeous midnight blue paintwork. And I must give serious credit to Richard for picking just about the best base car I could imagine. In fact, the only thing I want on this car that it doesn't have is the pop up posh BO sound system. The other thing I don't like is this carbon GT4 splitter. It just looks, well, daft. It looks like the car's going around doing this. It's not right, partly because it's so big and for me incongruous, partly because the regular V8 Vantage S is already perfect, and also because the car's had some extra frippery added here, but none really at the back. So it's now a very unbalanced design. The only other item outside that I don't like is the badges, and I do know here that Richard is in total agreement. And though it may sound like a really, really tiny thing, when it comes to a car like an Aston Martin, the details matter. For me, these carbon fiber badges just don't work. I know to some tastes, they'd be perfect, but I like a more full color enamel Aston Martin badge. And if you've seen Seen Through Glasses video on how those are made, you'll appreciate just how special they are. The reason this one looks so odd is because the carbon fiber bonnet has no recess for it to sit in. My first thought actually was, tell you what, let's take a leaf at the 911 GT3 RS playbook. Put a sticker on there, that'll match the whole lightweight ethos. But then I thought, no, 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 no. That goes against the Aston Martin thing. You want nice premium stuff. So my idea was either put the enamel badge back on, get something custom commissioned that's a little flatter, fix the bonnet, which is always a possibility, or I had this idea that for the front grille, which now has a mesh rather than the slats, if you've got a slightly finer mesh, you could spray paint on the Aston Martin logo. Would that look terrible? Please tell me in the comment section down below. Happily, the interior treatment I think is much more successful. I generally love these Cobra seats, although a couple of pieces of feedback, I think they might need to be angled ever so slightly further back, but that is likely specific to me. One small thing that does need to change, and this is the kind of level that Richard is working to, and I know he will want to sort, the adjustment is currently very difficult. These just slide forward and backwards. They already sit on custom frame rails, but the problem is where the little grab handle is to move the seat forward and backwards, it's pressed into the carpet. So to try and get the thing forward or backwards, it's actually quite some effort, particularly if you have it quite far forward, if you've got short legs like me. And uh, that's gonna need to be fixed by either bending the rail ever so slightly, or maybe even putting a nice little leather strip down there so you can grab it and operate that. Most of the rest of the interior is pretty standard. The pedals have been changed, like I said, or the pedal faces anyway, and that does make a big difference. By default, this is a car quite difficult to heel and toe, and that's just not right. One other item that's changed, which I'm not a fan of, is the gear lever. Now, in his little description, Richard says that that's aluminium, but I'm really not convinced that it is. The stalk certainly is, but the ball itself feels more plasticky, and I'm not a fan for a couple of reasons. First off, just doesn't feel nice in the hand. Secondly, it's too light for my liking. I do like a fairly weighted gear knob. There's been a couple of times I've been driving the car and actually I haven't quite engaged the gear properly. And I feel like just having a slightly heavier gear knob may help with that sort of thing. 
I don't know, maybe it's just me being useless. Beyond that though, lovely place to be as every Aston Martin is. And in fact, I think there's a few areas Richard could go a little bit further. So I think these little door handles down here could be in that kind of satin red effect that you see on many sort of military style things. You know the stuff that I'm talking about. My cameras have buttons and the same sort of thing. And where the electric seat controls are, now redundant, I think you could have a, a little custom build plug. That'd be nice, I think. But overall, it's still a V8 Vantage S in a glorious specification. It is a gorgeous, gorgeous car. I like it a lot. But um, most importantly, how does it drive? Because that's where it gets really interesting. carry on just to remind you of a few very important things. Firstly, this car is not finished. Secondly, all of these cars will be built to the individual's specifications. There is no such thing as one fixed spec for a CTR Vantage. And if you are wondering how do you buy one, how much does it cost, well the fact is I can't really tell you because that depends on how much you want to spend. But the fact is the premium Richard is asking is fairly modest. There is a set fee for building the car. And the work, by the way, is done by Stuart Hall, an ex-Subaru WRC guy. So um, it's not exactly thrown together in a shed by someone who doesn't know what they're doing. And thirdly, Richard has explicitly asked me to give him pure, unfiltered feedback on how I feel about this car. And he very kindly has allowed me to invite you to join in that process to see the kind of things that go through my mind and his when it comes to talking about something like this. First thing actually is that these wipers are absolutely useless. I'm hoping that it'll try and wash the uh, headlights in a moment because that's actually much more effective. Kind of like my old Lotus, but these, these are useless. I, I'm basically blind now. I'm going to turn this around in a second because this is actually a bit sketchy. Like I may have said earlier, this splitter really impressing me because when I came along here in a hurricane, every single one of these bumps and dips was just <laughs> this is really good see there I thought it would do it but it did not I love this bit of road as well and actually here this car really really works it also at absolutely all times feels monumentally special the choice of this car and this specification in particular I think is genius because it's magic and there's been plenty of times on this trip where I've been annoyed with the car but the fact is when you get the right road and the right moment it's absolutely sublime the combination of that soundtrack this lovely interior that view out the front the Aston Martin badge the knowledge of what you're in and the history that comes with it something pretty special this and I think you'd be a cold person to not be at least a little bit excited by it right let's turn around and hit those bumpy sections again because we've got some things to discuss. really is amazing. Just before he delivered it to me, Richard said he just put on a fresh set of Michelin Pilot Sport Cup 2s. And I said, cheers Richard. Um, <laughs> you do know I'd said I'm going to take it to Scotland in January, don't you? And he went, oh, um, are they not the right tyres? I was like, bah, bah. well, I mean, actually Cup 2s can be a bit better than you expect. And it is actually milder up here than down south. But um, I said, if it's at all possible, could I have some PS4Ss? So he put those on and even he said immediately the difference was noticeable in both grip and ride comfort these are a better tire and that's actually a great start point i think for discussing a very important topic and that's what's the car going to be used for if it's a road biased car and i think this really should be a road biased thing you're always going to be thinking about what makes it better on the road it's really really easy when you start talking about performance modifications reducing weight increasing power cornering ability that kind of stuff 
to just try and turn something into a track car. There are other people out there that build track-focused Vantages. Valiant and Cost do a, a great job. But I think what Richard is doing, the way he originally described the project to me, is to make a car that's more road-focused. And here on the road, one thing this car does have plenty of is power. The reduction in weight, the slight power increase, and the fact that 4.7 is already a fairly healthy thing anyway, mean that this is more than quick enough. It's fabulous. Woo. I must actually say, even the 4.3 that he did after the mods was more than pokey enough, but this brings just another element of engagement because you now have two ways of driving this car. You can simply change up at about 3,500, 4,000 RPM and ride the healthy wave of torque, or you can drop a few gears and you can rev it out. Oh, doesn't it sound good? Though for my money, a touch too loud. I know I am a bit of a killjoy in that department, old before my time and all that jazz, but um, this is the quiet exhaust that Richard offers. In truth, I think it's about as loud as the regular exhaust with the valves open. This car has also had the secondary cats removed, which is a very common and popular thing to do to Vantages. It's still got the primary cats, they're intact, they're unchanged, and frankly, if you were to then put sports cats in this car, it would simply be too raucous. It would be just far, far too much. So for me, this exhaust is about the limit. I actually would prefer one that's just a little less vocal. You can also do some fun stuff with the exhaust layout too, put different X pipes and things in to actually quite change the sound. This one is a very barrel chested, almost American sounding thing, particularly if you labor it at lower RPM. So we change up now, give you a bit of that. That's sort of, that's American muscle car, isn't it? I do quite like that, I must admit. A little bit incongruous, perhaps. However, one thing that I have now decided, I, I've always thought about having a Vantage, and I flip constantly between, well, do I have the V8, do I have the V12? In my head, in my head I say, get the V8, get the V8. It's more than enough, it's gonna suit the car better, it'll be lighter, you can get a manual, much cheaper, it'll work. But then, of course, the heart goes, yeah, but V12. Come on, V12, it's just better, isn't it? But actually, no. The V8 suits this car down to a T. The bigger cars, DBS, Vanquish, DB9, all that, the V12 is the perfect partner. Not that you can have a V8 in those anyway, but for this, this is the right engine. Response, absolutely fantastic. Though, one other criticism I have, and this is not of what Richard has done, instead the base car, the throttle pedal, it's just, it responds nicely. In sport mode, I think a bit too keenly because it nearly turns it into a switch, however, when you're trying to do heel and turn one, or sometimes you get these weird rev hangs. You may have even heard it in a few drive-bys. It's not my people being incompetent. That's just kind of what the car winds up doing. Very frustrating. So the powertrain, pretty good, pretty sorted. I know, again, it's not quite finished. There are some more tweaks to be done that may unleash a little bit more power, but overall, I've got absolutely no problems with it as it is. Tire choice, absolutely perfect, but the really critical bit of this car, where I felt the S really missed the target, was in the handling, the delicacy, and the feel. What to me is intrinsic to the Aston-ness of a car. Just look at these cars and you immediately think old school, proper GT, continent cruisers. This is the kind of car where going from one end of the country to the other should be no trouble whatsoever. And actually, the Vantage, in many ways, isn't very good at that. First off, the boot is really, really disappointingly stingy, quite frustrating. Second, it's quite a noisy car, this. Now, I don't know if that's got something to do with the choice of wheel and tire, but road noise is quite pronounced, more so than I recall it being in many other cars. Maybe that's because I've never done this amount of miles in an Aston, but this is also one of the benefits of having the car for just that little bit longer. However, my big issue with the regular V8 Vantage S was a fairly simple one. It's just too stiff. The suspension, far too hardcore. It isn't comfortable, it isn't pleasant. The setup, by the way, is passive. I don't believe this generation of Vantage ever got adaptive dampers, but it was just way too firm. It's unpleasant. For the kind of roads that I like to enjoy, it was just overly harsh, and that meant two things. First off, you're gonna back off fairly soon because you're just not enjoying it. Secondly, I think it actually, at points, could be dangerous because if your suspension is too stiff, simply put, there may be points where the tire isn't fully in contact with the ground. And the fact is, you can have the stickiest rubber in the entire world, but if it's not touching the floor, it'll do you no good. 
and the V8 Vantage S, along with many other Astons of the period, like the DBS, they were just inexplicably firm. There was no need for it. The other day I went out and drove the new Lotus Amira, and I actually drove one with the sports chassis, the stiffer setting one, and it was glorious. It was like a limousine in comparison to this, and that's the problem. So this car's currently got a set of three-way adjustable coilovers on it. I'm not quite sure exactly how they're set up, but I do know that Richard isn't particularly happy with them, and neither am I. You see, what I said about the original V8 Vantage S was that the engine was pretty good, the looks are pretty good, the interior could use some work, the seats needed changing, that's all been done. The visual stuff I've talked about already, but what the car lacked was that sense of delicacy, that sense of working with the road rather than simply thumping down along it. And here that's still there. I wouldn't say that it's maybe any worse than before, though there is a possibility that it is, but it certainly isn't improved. I think a few things have happened here. First off, I know the suspension is not to the requirements that Richard had, and that's one of the reasons he is not happy with it. And this kind of stuff is exactly what I was talking about. Richard, I know, is going through many different combinations of wheel, tyre, suspension, all sorts of different things, trying to find what is the perfect balance. And more than that, trying to find different setups that will work for different needs, different places. The suspension as it is now, on smoother pieces of tarmac, it's fine, it's great, it's lovely. The primary ride is very, very good. But it's those imperfections, those little sharp edges in the road, which unfortunately, Scotland and England are both full of, where it really doesn't work all that well. I have a suspicion that the wheels themselves are partly responsible because they look rather heavy and I'm told that they are rather heavy. I personally would have rather a nice set of 19 inch lightweight items, maybe even the standard ones, and I would have also been tempted by a carbon ceramic brake upgrade, which I do believe Richard offers. I know it's certainly available for the Vantage. I then want to pair that with a suspension that dials things back a little bit. Even more than that, I'd be very tempted, and I do believe Richard is open to this, about looking into an adaptive damper setup. And that, I think, would certainly help the Aston have the best of both worlds, because then you could have the more comfy, plush ride for your long trip up to Scotland. Then, when you find a piece of tarmac like this, which is relatively good, relatively smooth, and you do want to have a little bit more fun, a little bit more engagement, that you could then turn it into sport mode and have your fun. What actually for me bothers me maybe just as much as the fact the thing is just a bit too stiff and not enjoyable is also the fact that it's, um, it's lost its delicacy, it's lost its feel, and that for me is a big problem. Aston Martin steering by default has a really nice feel, a delicacy about it, even stuff like the DB9 where maybe you wouldn't expect it. It's a lovely, really communicative car, and these normally are as well. But this particular one, it's still got a nice weight into it, it's still very hefty, quite satisfying, very meaty steering wheel, but it's lost the feedback, it's lost the texture. You don't get that fine grain of the road that comes through the likes of the best 911s and stuff like that. And that to me is just where the car falls short. is I'm almost certain this is definitely something that can be fixed and something I know that Richard is really keen on. He loves his good steering, as do I. He and I tend to agree on pretty much everything. It's one of the reasons he was very, very kind in letting me borrow this car, take it out here and have a drive of it. And honestly, it has been pretty damn good. But there is still some way to go. And I would love to invite you all right now to tell me how would you treat a car like this? What would you do? I think going forward, we're gonna see a lot more of this kind of stuff. We've seen it in the Porsche world for quite a few years, the resto mod scene essentially. And now I think with people, particularly the likes of us, being a little bit indifferent to many modern cars. And so I think there's now a great opportunity for people like Richard to say, hey, tell you what, you missed the boat, you feel like you missed out, and you know what? Maybe your perfect Aston isn't out there. So let's build it. I would love to see that. In fact, I think there'd be a great market for that with other stuff like the Audi R8. First gen R8 in particular, I bet you could do a really, really cool version of one of these. And I might suggest that to Richard because I think that's also a car which was damn close to being brilliant, but just missed the mark. And if you've absolutely no idea who this Richard chap is and why I'm blathering on about him all the time, check out either his channel, Challenge the Road, or the interview that I did with him where he discussed not just his love of cars, but also some really interesting stuff from his life that I think is really worth listening to. Anyway, for now, back to work for me. And as ever, a huge thank you to Richard for lending me his car and to you for watching. Don't forget to hit the like button, comment down below, subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you for the next one. Bye-bye.